Markets around the world are coming off a crazy week. We had big tech earnings, FOMC, and NFP that really brought the volatility. But as next week unfolds, we have a light week of data and earnings, and that means technicals, supply and demand will dictate everything. And that will tell us if last week was a buy the rumor, sell the news, or simply just a buy, buy, buy. We're also going to discuss key levels and our expectations for the next week ahead. But we're also going to discuss a few crucial things going on under the hood. China is breaking out. Better than expected GDP numbers set a fire under stocks and they are breaking out. And today we will discuss if that is going to continue. And of course earnings. We need to discuss what's coming for earnings this week, what to expect as well as my fair valuation. Where does the opportunity lie? We've got a lot to talk about so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Guys we're trying to get 10,000 subscribers in May so go ahead subscribe tell your friends and get them to like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm it really really helps me out let's get into it this is the weekly heat map of the s p 500 now we can actually see a lot of red a lot of green but the big players that really move the market did really do a lot of the heavy lifting look at apple up eight percent for the week that really did help the tech sector as a whole especially nvidia here on semiconductors microsoft finished flat after being down nearly nine percent here in april and then google and meta were doing their own thing now google down 2.7 percent for the week and that's because it was up nine percent last week we're also going to talk about google a little later on in the video we saw tesla put up another seven percent and then amazon three percent up for the week that did coincide with quite a lot of drama as well here in energy as well as financials they really did exhibit quite a bit of weakness here in the week other than that you know we saw green here in utilities all of the market getting a bit jittery a bit defensive early on in the week we saw green in real estate because of the rate cut situation as well as some of these defensive sectors there were winners there were losers such goes the market now looking at sectors from a weekly basis we could see a couple of things as well utilities was actually the best sector for the week so a bit of a defensive trade and then we had regional banks and home construction as the next best sectors at three percent and 1.63 percent followed by xlre rate sensitive sectors were the highlight of this week point we actually saw semiconductors were relatively flat for the week despite the outperformance that we did see in technology and i think a lot of people are rotating from semiconductors into technology because the discrepancy between them is quite significant semiconductors trade at an average of about 32x xlk trades at about 27x so those that do want exposure to technology are just probably going for the cheaper option at least that's what i saw in the flows this week but we did see commodity driven sectors we did see commodity driven sectors look at gdx look at xle lose this week and that was because of the inflation narrative that weak jobs report as well as weaker pmis meant rate cuts are coming and that's why we saw cyclicals outperformed we did see a bit of defensive buying as well and then rate sensitive sectors really did do the most but if we actually have a look at the majors we saw bonds for the week put out 1.18 percent here in the tlt iwm not far behind up 1.78 percent commodities took it on the chin all week particularly after monday printing lower lows and lower highs pretty much all week until it found a bottom here on thursday and this was largely driven by a bunch of the macro factors and disinflationary drivers leading up to the nfp report as well as the pmi numbers they were pretty bad here on tuesday as well as here on friday but excluding commodities it was really here on wednesday early thursday where we put in a bottom possibly a double bottom and then we really saw markets come to life rallying towards the end of the week equities rallied bonds rallied on that news as well look at tlt iwm dow jones the nasdaq the s p 500 even the rsp but you do have to look at this in aggregate the rsp was pretty much flat for the week and that's because we spent the majority of the week here in negative territory it was only really after thursday late thursday into friday that we really saw saw us flip positive for the week thanks to the mega caps thanks to stocks like apple so we're going to talk about the rsp now i want to talk about the broader market and its equal weight in the market and its effect on the rally instead of the s p 500 i would go ahead and talk about small caps or mid caps but do take into consideration that mid caps and the rsp trade roughly the same the charts look the same they they move very very similarly and iwm is simply four percent of the stock market it doesn't have a big overall way 
weight on what's actually happening. And I do think that the S&P 500 right now and the equal weight have a bigger weight as to what's actually going on in the overall stock market right now than the IWM. So let's dive in. We're actually going to start here at the weekly chart. So you can definitely see we are in an uptrend in the RSP making higher lows as we continue. And then we also made an all time high right here. And now we're also putting another higher low. So you have to understand that on a weekly chart until we probably breach this level right here. And at worst, this level right here, we are still in a technical uptrend. And we do want to look to buy dips at these levels reaching for all time highs in the RSP. Now we can actually just zoom in a little bit and we can see some very glaring things very similar to the RSP. We've actually been in a balance range right here for quite some time. Call it a correction in time. Some people like to call it a balance zone. However, it hasn't been completely flat. In fact, it's had a slight trend as you can see right there and that has exhibited strength at the same time on the weekly chart. Like I said, you know, we've put in a low, higher low, higher low at the same time, you know, putting a high right here, higher high, new all time highs. That's very, very bullish. That's what you want to see. Now we have pulled back and this is concerning on a weekly chart. However, you have to put it into consideration that ultimately this right here is the zone that if we were to break below this zone, this is when we would get concerned and anywhere between here and you know 154 we just want to buy dips looking for all time highs so why is this such an important zone well we used it as resistance right here right here kind of right here and then resistance turned into support and then we moved higher and broke out to new all time highs so it's only logical that if we do pull back to this line we will use it as a very strong line of support because look at all of the areas of confluence now we are in a weekly uptrend we know that everything's looking very very healthy on the weekly chart what about the daily chart and very similar to the weekly chart actually not much has changed overall we can see a couple of things right 154 continues to be a very very critical zone and we have actually found support right here now this is a critical zone also simply because we did use this previous zone as resistance multiple times before we broke out right here to go make new all-time highs like we did here at about the 170 range very very constructive so we are actually using this level right here this confluence level as a very very strong line of support which was previous resistance you can also see a couple of things zooming into the daily chart firstly we are in a technical daily downtrend how do we know because we broke this low right here and we're using this as support however we have found support we have actually rallied quite substantially and we have actually pulled back however we are forming a higher low relative to this low right here very very constructive and you can actually see that there was big wicks right here which means strong buy came in after the sellers came in and pushed us higher. Now, unlike the S&P 500, where we closed above the previous pullback high, the RSP actually did close below that high and we didn't even wick above it. And that just goes to show the strength of the mega caps versus the overall S&P 500 industry on an equal weight basis. However, this is constructive, number one, because it is a higher low and we actually did put in an equal high relative to this high right there or a slightly lower equal high, but it's inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. What I want to see this week is a continued push in the overall market, a broadening out of the market. Normally the mega caps go first. We saw them go first today, last week, and I want to see the rest of the market push up in a very strong way, at least by Wednesday, Thursday. We've got a light week of earnings, a light week of data, so they can really move uninterrupted by the macro, the fundamental, and everything will just come down to the technical. And that's what I want to see. I want to see the RSP break this high. Don't test below this level right here. Those two levels are one 160 and 164. And what we want to do is break above 164, use our support, continue higher, and then we can go attack this high right here, this level right here, and then all time highs in the RSP. I am bullish in the overall market moving higher to new all time highs from where we are. And this is just a dip buying opportunity. If you missed your opportunity in the S&P 500, if you missed your opportunity in the NASDAQ, there is still opportunity for you to get long in the RSP, especially if we do pull back, let's say Monday on the open, we do pull back to these levels right here and then move higher. Higher, that would be opportunity for you to enter for those of you that didn't get in here for those of you that didn't get in here so i am bullish at 160 above 160 to move higher but we really want to see by wednesday by thursday the market break this level break above close above and let's go attack some of these levels right here below 160 we look at 158 and if we get below 158 i'll update you what happens but i am bullish i'm constructively bullish and anything on monday tuesday that's above 160 we will go eventually rally higher to break some of these highs and potentially new all-time highs into May OPEX. Now let's talk a bit about sentiment. This is the BOFA bull bear indicator sitting at 5.2 right now.
right now we actually ticked up from 5.1 a couple of weeks ago we were just at 5.0 so the sentiment here is flipping a little bit towards the sell side and what this is telling us is that the market tends to like where we are sitting right now and we may go down a bit we may go up a bit but we're probably going to transverse between this four and six area here for a while at least until the market has digested Powell's words as well as the jobs data at the same time the Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator sitting at 0.7 is pretty much telling us that positioning is not stretched and what these two indicators are telling us that if you haven't nibbled already it's time to probably add a bit of exposure because we can see some upbeat momentum in the market and if you are in equities hold those equities now let's actually talk about earnings for this week not a huge week in terms of market cap there are some big players but definitely a pivotal week so the big one that everyone's going to be watching on twitter on monday is going to be palantir as well as hims and her health they're reporting they're some of the bigger names on monday and on tuesday we have walt disney before the close celsius holdings data dogs crocs nicola race bp very very name brand stocks right here at the same time tuesday rivian arista networks upstart win lift oxy twillow confluent toast right very very big names a lot of people hold these stocks so they are going to be paying attention to these a lot of growth stocks are reporting this week and then we have two big ones on wednesday we have uber arm as well as shopify robin hood firm acm research and a couple of other names like beyond meet the trade desk toyota then on thursday there's not too much going on we've got clean spark a bitcoin miner we got warner bros right here a marathon so a lot of the bitcoin miners are going to be reporting on thursday and then on friday not much at all that i could see that i would be interested in so a pretty big week of earnings not so much in market cap but if you are a growth investor you probably have a stock or two reporting this week and you really want to pay attention to everything that's going on now we have a fairly modest week of earnings but we also have a very modest week of data we got a couple of fed speakers that's probably the biggest thing then we just got the standard university of michigan sentiment initial jobless claims wholesale inventories and then consumer credit that's really all on the cards for data this week but i digress let's get back to the earnings front we can actually see that the s p 500 is reporting 7.1 percent growth here in earnings for this quarter remember at the start of earnings season we were looking at 3.5 percent that was the penciled in expectations and so earnings are coming in really really good this is actually a fantastic number don't get anybody wrong despite all the fear uncertainty and doubt you're seeing in the market right now when it comes to names like starbucks like mcdonald's you have to understand that earnings are doing really really good and the players that should be reporting good the market movers are look at apple look at microsoft look at google now where does that leave us with valuation so the next 12 month pe in the s p 500 is sitting at 20.1 times and in my personal opinion i think that 20 times is fair value for the s p 500 and many people say why 20 times they often think 16 times or 17 times is fair value and yes in the 1970s or the 1980s that may have been the case but the way i see it is that 20 times at the s p 500 with the 10-year tips yield at two percent actually represents a three percent equity risk premium over the current yield at 20 times and to me that is fair value and a three percent risk premium is actually the average of stocks versus bonds in the last 200 years that is why i think 20 times right now in this market with the current composition of the s p 500 is fair value so if you go ahead buy this right now i think you'll get eight to ten percent returns compounded annually for the next 10 years especially with how tech heavy industrial heavy and healthcare heavy the s p 500 is right now now ev to sales were trading at three year in the s p 500 ev to a beta trading at 15 times price to book 4.7 and a 3.4 percent free cash flow yield now the most expensive sector is technology and that's obviously because these tech companies tend to be high quality great balance sheet companies and then right after that we have this consumer discretionary and then industrials on the midway point trading under the s p 500 in terms of valuation we actually have staples materials healthcare and comp services and i say this every single week healthcare and comp services probably the place you want to be if you're looking for growth at a reasonable price look at the free cash flow yield 5.2 percent here 3.8 percent and then a peg of 1 1.1 very reasonable valuation especially for the companies you're getting out in here you're getting a bit of growth you're getting a bit of defensive companies great sectors to be in if you really want to look at diversifying your portfolio and then the value sectors real estate financials and energy they trade well below the s p 500 pe but there's reasons for it now let's talk a bit about seasonality this right here is the s p 500 performance after a bear market or near a bear market ends 1950 to current the returns we can expect in the first year the second year and the returns during those bear markets so you can see that the average bear market has a drawdown of 29.4 percent a median drawdown of 25.4 percent and then the first year return is often 38.7 percent and then the second year return on average is 13.5 percent the s p 500 last year 
actually returned about 26%. And in the second year, we're currently sitting at about 5.6% return. So based on historical averages, our bear market is actually lagging what the average is and the median. And we haven't finished the second year of this bull market that we're currently in. You also have to understand that the average bull market lasts 56 months. And right now we are only in month 18 in this bull market. So there's still quite a bit of runway in this bull market. You want to buy any dips we do get like the pullback. We just got this 5% correction. It was a gift. If you didn't buy the dip, probably going to be a while because we're probably going back to all time highs. And this is another very interesting analog here. This is just when 4% pullbacks become 10% corrections and the current pullback juxtaposed against every other 10% correction since 1950. Now I want to show you guys something very interesting here. Okay. This is the amount of days, the correction, and then this is the percentage return. So this is 10%, this is 12%. The majority of returns are sort of in this period right here. Okay. In the 30 day period. So the average 4% pullback turns to a 10% pullback within 30. You could say maybe 40 to 50 days, but that is the average, right? Now have a look at 140 days, 120 days, 100 days, and 80 days, right? There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven pullbacks since 1950 have gone from 4% to 10% and have lasted more than 80 days. In other words, if you get a 10% pullback or a 4 to 10% pullback, you should look to buy the dip because generally speaking, after about 30 days, you're going to see the momentum move higher. And generally speaking, 30 to 50 days is about the average based on this data right here. When we do have the pullback, the 4% does turn into a 10% pullback, and then we move higher from there. And I'm willing to bet on the fact as well that these corrections right here were in very like serious times. I'm talking like maybe it was 2008, maybe it was 2000, maybe it was 71, those type of years. And this pretty much tells us that bottoms tend to be events and then tops tend to be a process. So when you do get dips, guys, you want to buy, you want to buy aggressively and you want to buy quickly. Now, this is some very interesting commentary from Goldman and Goldman simply outlined two key risks that the market is currently overlooking. Those two risks are antitrust as well as the US presidential election. One example relates to the upcoming US presidential election. In their most recent US election monitor, our colleagues in US economic research note that President Biden and former President Trump are roughly even in national polling. President Biden and President Trump have substantially different fiscal agendas and the election outcomes will have important implications for tax policy, spending, tariffs, and a bunch of other stuff. So pretty much Goldman have come out and said that they don't believe that the US election is properly reflected into the price of stocks. Another area where there is potential risk is antitrust. Goldman believe that investors have not ascribed the proper valuation discount to US companies most vulnerable to government intervention. The government's antitrust focus primarily relates to four or five of the largest market cap stocks in the US, those being Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, and a few others. The DOJ and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, have collectively filed more than five lawsuits alleging anti-competitive behavior by leading big tech firms. So those are two risks that Goldman see the market have completely overlooked. Now guys, something else we saw this week was a lot of strength in the Chinese economy. We saw the HSI rally quite significantly off its lows and it's up 20% off its lows right here, breaking key levels, breaking above moving averages. And this is the place you want to go long in Chinese stocks. And Chinese investors are recognizing that. Chinese buyers are currently front running Hong Kong stock rally. You can see net purchases of Hong Kong shares by Chinese investors in March and April. They were huge net buyers of shares in US dollars. This is $8 billion, $10 billion worth of net inflows into the HSI. And this is probably a signal to go long because when you have the government supporting equities and when you have investors looking to buy equities, this can really provide huge upside surprises. And this is the type of stuff we saw, you know, in 2008, in 2020, when the stimulus came in, we saw a huge amount of net purchases into equities, not necessarily into Chinese stocks. I'm talking about in the US, in, in the global market. And that did provide a huge tailwind. So um, if you're looking for value and growth at a reasonable price, you can look at the Chinese market, but do take into consideration that there's a lot of risk with that, the CCP risk. Now on my Twitter, I've done a bunch of valuations on a ton of names and earnings. I'm just going to go through my buy, sell and hold recommendations. So Meta right here, guys, these are the assumptions I use. My uh, Meta's current price at the time of writing this was 418. My fair value is 552 and the discount to the share price is 24.24. Same year with PayPal, I recommend a buy rating. I think fair value is at $100. It last traded at about $67. Well, now in terms of hold ratings, I have Apple at a hold rating. I think the stock is slightly overpriced. It's trading at a 12% premium to its current share price, as well as Google. Despite the great earnings that Google did, I think that fair value of the stock is about at about 160 
160. It's trading at about 174 right now. It's trading at about a 9% premium there. And then stocks I would look to sell is actually uh, Starbucks. I think fair value for the stock is 56. The current price is 74. And I do think we're going to see material downside in Starbucks, particularly with the CEO. He came out and said, we have not been able to communicate to them the value that we provide. So what we are doing about it, is it's not business as usual, but there's an action plan we have in place in order to do that, to reach them and to communicate the value that we are providing. Now, I don't know if that is like a pre-rehearsed segment or if he just doesn't want to come out and say that we're going to be decreasing prices. But either way, I don't think the problem that Starbucks is having has to do with value communication or their value proposition. I think it just has to do with prices. Their prices are too damn high. The market recognizes that. And instead of going to a Starbucks, they're just going to go to the coffee shop next door whose coffee is $4 cheaper. I do think that Starbucks is going to go lower and we should find a floor anywhere from 50 to 50 55 dollars here for starbucks now guys looking at a trade idea for this week now this isn't a trade idea for the week ahead this is actually just a trade idea for the next three to six months call it a swing trade now tlt this is the 20-year treasury bond is down 8.54 percent for the year and it's been a complete dumpster fire in the last five years down 27 percent and if we actually look at it on a peak to trough basis you know it's down like nearly 50 percent here now what we're actually trying to find is we're trying to go long in treasuries purely because of the macro now i guess you could look at this on a technical basis and say we're definitely finding you know some bottom but i do think that we're going to see some fantastic movement here in the treasury market based on the macro front simply because of tapering now i put this post here on twitter and i said there's an 80 percent chance that the 10-year yield high is likely in for the year with fed qt taper issuance pressure is reduced by 20 percent long duration tlt risk to reward is asymmetrically skewed to the upside and we sort of did see this here on friday we saw a massive gap up we saw the bears did come in on this candle but the bulls took us all the way higher year in the tlt on friday that coincides with a very very green candle the day prior so you know the market's definitely liking this action right here and it's certainly some of the most bullish action we've seen in a while so ideally what we want to look for is definitely a long play because i think the pressure on yields and bonds over the coming months is definitely going to ease and this is going to move higher coupled with the fact that if we do get rate cuts bonds go higher because yield and bonds have an inverse relationship we should see tlt 20-year treasury move a lot higher so what are levels i'm potentially eyeing down let's just actually change this okay so we zoom out there's very very clear levels that i want to play this long to the first one is actually just the 94 level right there the second one is this 98 level and then the third one is just the 100 level which is the high year in mid to late december after yields came down from about five percent in the in the 10 year all the way down to about 3.8 percent this would represent you know, about a 5% upside from where we are, that will represent a 9% upside, and that would represent an 11% upside in capital appreciation. Coupled with the fact that in a three to six month period, you'll also be collecting the yield on this, and that would help your excess return as well. On a very longer term basis, I mean, if we do go ahead and actually break this zone right here, this $100 zone, you know, we could definitely look at stuff like 105 uh, and even as high as 110. This is going to be a major zone of resistance for the TLT, the 110 level. And ultimately, this 110 level is the level that we do want to play the TLT for potential upside in the very bull case. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.